Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of 30 Minutes Robotic Milking Edition. I'm your host, Marcia Andres, dairy science professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. Today with us, we also have Jim Sulfur, um, your co-host, uh, dairy extension educator at the St. Cloud Regional Office. Good morning, Jim. Welcome everyone on this at least snowy Minnesota day. Yes, it's a mess, huh? It's going to be snowing and I think freezing rain, everything. <laughs> Not the greatest thing. Anyway, just a few reminders before we get going and invite our dairy producer to join us. Uh, if you're watching uh, this um, webinar as a recording and you wanted to participate in the live uh, virtual discussion next time, please register at z.umn.edu slash 30 M-I-N-R-M. These webinars, like I said, are recorded, so you also get a, a link to the playlist once you register for the webinar. And then every month, you also get a reminder about the webinar. So if you register once, you don't have to register again. We are going to be using the Q&A uh, session. Um, box for the questions and comments. So please do not use the chat. Uh, just type your questions and comments in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and then uh, Jim or I will ask uh, your question on your behalf for the producer to respond to. Since many of you here might be interested in technology, I would just like to let you know that we are having a conference in June uh, here in Minnesota about precision dairy. And uh, it's going to be at the Hyatt, Hyatt Regency near the St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis St. Minneapolis Paul Airport. Uh, so please uh, look into the de details at the website here. And it's really we're trying to focus on um, close to the producer. So hopefully many producers can attend, uh, let your friends know and uh, join us. So today is my pleasure to invite uh, a dairy producer that's unique today. We have an organic grazing dairy. Uh, so I'm very excited about the discussion today. So I'll invite Jan to join us uh, for the discussion and short presentation about his operation. Hi, Jan, good morning. Hi. Thank you for joining us all the way from Oregon, I guess virtually, but <laughs> from Oregon. So I'm going to go away and I'll do my best to move the slides for you. And then uh, we'll come back for the, I'll come back for the question and answer session. So. Thanks, Marcia. So um, that's a picture of our barn. Um, and it's a really brief background. We started the farm in 2015. It was a conventional cornfield. Uh, we built everything from scratch. Um, and one of the first things we did was transition organic. Um, so we're an organic uh, dairy uh, that milks with robots. Um, and at this point, uh, we had two robots. Um, we had a classic uh, of the owner's photo. The left-hand robot there is a classic. The right-hand robot is a V300. Um, and we run a three-way gate uh, just above that uh, that cuts cows to either water uh, when they go right if they don't have milking permissions or if we've decided there's too many cows in those waiting areas and we don't want to overcrowd it so that the timid cows still get a chance to get through quickly. Um, or when they go into the waiting area, they get water there. And then again, when they come out of the robots, they go through another gate and they can either get water there or if they're cut to the close-up alley or the dry cow alley, uh, they're able to get water there. So water in our system is a really big driver in this kind of guided flow. We found that people originally said, you know, if you have, you know, really tasty grain in the, in the robot, that that's going to work because we started out free flow. For us, it didn't work. The milking frequency was low. Uh, we had to keep full-time people on to move cows. Part of it was our training. Part of it was just, I think the retrofit, we didn't have that long skinny barn where it was just really intuitive for the cows. They'd kind of get lost in the corners and it, it just didn't work. When we switched to the guided flow, we saw within five days, the cows were happy. They were calm. Uh, they weren't being chased around the barn, um, and the milking frequency went way up. Uh, currently, today, we're sitting at 3.37 milkings, um, and the average gate passages, which to me is really important because each time they go through a gate, that's the opportunity to milk. That's the number I'm trying to drive up, uh, is 17.6. Now, I'm not sure if it's counting the robot as part of that gate passage. That's something I need to confirm, but even if it did, we're still 6, 7, 8, 9, you know, opportunities per day for each cow to milk, which is great. 
and we have a lot of excess capacity in the system right now. Um, so what's been happening in our co-op and in organic these last few years has been really tough. Um, we got in kind of at the peak and you know, ever since then the, the market just kind of like tanked and quotas came into play, space was capped, you couldn't ship any more milk. And we were like, ah, we built hoping we could ship more milk. Um, finally, the co-op has said, great, you can ship more milk. So uh, Marcy, if you wanna jump to the next slide. So now this is what we're doing this year. Um, on the far left of the of this image, you can see where it says dry cows there, excuse my chicken scratch. Um, that was currently our heifer barn. And we're gonna convert that to be our dry cow barn. In the organic world with our co-op, they will cap us at what's called four animal units. And an animal unit is basically a thousand pounds of cow per acre. We have 50 acres here, but we get five, six cuttings a year. It's really fertile ground with good irrigation. Um, but we can basically graze 200 cows. We can't graze any heifers or we're going to be over our animal limits in terms of what our co-op wants. We have to attain at least 30% dry matter intake throughout our grazing season to be organically compliant. And uh, during that organic compliance period, we have to, if we can be grazing, we have to be grazing. Our grazing season is typically sometime mid-March to mid-October. It's really long. It's over 200 days. Um, so it's a considerable consideration into it um, that I'll come back to. But looking at this, so what, what we have here is our pasture sim system simplifies a great deal. We used to do an A, B, C kind of setup, and we had a dual grazing lane where there was one lane that was off this side of the farm, another lane that was off that side of the farm. Now we're just going to have one lane out, one lane in. And we can have gates that go to either side of the farm. So cows are in this pasture or this pasture, not and this pasture, making it a whole lot simpler for us to make sure the cows come in. A lot easier to run our dry cows and our milk cows as one grazing group. So we only have to manage one group. But we can also make sure uh, that we're really focusing on managing the forage, getting it to the residual heights we want based on the time of year, making sure that we maintain both the regrowth and the forage quality uh, that we see in those pastures because it's such an important component of their diet. In the barn, we're gonna have three robots. And the third robot's gonna go right next to where we currently have our breed tree transport pen. Those robots will be able to, two robots, the two B300s will be able to cut cows to the breeding pen or the treat and transport pen to stay overnight. And that's also going to give us an option to do something that we haven't had to do in past, which is batch milk any cow that we're kind of like, mm, she's getting treatment, you know, we're not sure if her milk's good enough yet, so that we only have to have one wash cycle for those five or six cows, as opposed to five or six wash cycles, which are eating up robot capacity. We're going to be running a lot closer to capacity, kind of in that 10, 15% margin of excess capacity on the robots as compared to where we are now. We've got about 45, 50%. Um, because we're basically doubling the herd size this year. So a, there's a lot going on. Um, we're excited about it. Um, the system works really well. Manpower on this farm, there's myself and a hired guy. We do everything, um, except one thing that we need to get a whole lot better at. I know somebody will probably ask me about what do your maintenance costs look like on your robots? What does it take to run them? So there's the poster child for really good and then there's the spectrum, and then there's a poster child for really bad. Unfortunately, we're, we're on that end for the really bad. Um, we end up having really high uh, chemical costs, repairs, and maintenance costs. Um, our dealer told us that the best guys who are doing everything on their own between their chemicals, their repairs, their plan maintenance are about 700 bucks per robot per month. We're sitting at about 2,100. Average is 1,300. That's really big opportunity for us this year to improve on. We're looking forward to it. We're excited, and we're digging in. Um, and that alone will pay for that new robot if we can save that money uh, on the repairs and maintenance. Um, but the cow flow in this situation too, we've modified, we used to have all the cows come out of the robots and then they would go to that, yeah, right where their mouse is, there, there's a three-way gate and they would go to the right and they would get spit out where that water is. But now we're gonna have double the cows and we're like, where are we gonna get traffic jams? Hmm, maybe what we'll do instead is We'll cut all the cows to the left where it says milk cows, or I've written it in hand. There's water there. So that way we're not converging the cows that couldn't milk and the cows that just milk. And we basically, you know, we created a much better traffic flow, a lot less road blocking in the farm. 
uh, and then they carry down to the feed bunks. In the grazing season, it's all one-way traffic. They carry down to the feed bunk area when they come up for milking, but now they can go to the pasture gate. And the pasture gate says, hey, you can go outside, or hey, you're coming back inside because you didn't have milking permission, or there's a flipper there they can choose to just say, I just want to stay in the barn. It's hot. I don't want to go. It's a free flow grazing system. They're never locked in the paddock. They can choose to come and go as they want. At certain times of day, we go out, we set fence, and we say, if there's some cows out here, give them a push, just send them back to the barn really quick. But that's it. Other than that, this is a zero fetch system. During confinement time of the year, we never fetch a cow. We've got reports that'll show us if a cow hasn't come and milked in a long time, we'll go check her out. It's usually it's, it's you know, she's got a stone bruise on her foot um or something you know something's going on with her guts or whatever in terms of breeding we use an activity management system we use cow manager we tried callers before they didn't work as well for us uh cow manager has worked really well for us uh and we breed twice a day being organic we're really limited on tools that we have for breeding um we can't use you know sinking any of those kinds of things and of course like any other dairy we really want to keep our days in milk low so that we're keeping our milk peak really close and tight and hopefully producing that most amount of milk that we can. Um, yeah, Marcia, if you want to. Bef before you move from this slide, I would like also you to mention that your close up cows can come through the robot oh, to be yeah, trained, yeah. which I think is very unique on your system. Yeah, yeah. So this is a really good feature that we've always implemented. Um, we try to, again, not really want to push the cows. Um, I've seen some folks will take their cows, they train the cow by like, let's push them into the robot the first couple of times. That's not being mean to the cow. It's really hard on your back. And I just think it's unnecessary. And what we've done instead is twice a day, we open up a gate uh, from the close-up alley that goes right into that waiting pen for the classic. And we put them in there with even them, sort it out. They've got water. If they get hungry enough, they'll go through. If they want to lay down, they'll go through. They'll learn how to kind of fight and organize themselves amidst the other five or six cows that are standing in that pen to say, oh, I've got to go through this device. Once I go through here, I can come out. I can go through this gate and get used to doing that because there's gates all over the place in the barn. So, And they do this for two weeks. And so by the time that they're ever ready to milk, they've been in the robot several times. They've had a little bit of grain several times. They've had the robot moving around and spraying their teats several times. Now all we do is add milking. We never have to push a cow and we never have a problem. It works really, really well. Um, and the That's cows great. are so happy when they're trained. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And we need to kind of speed yeah. up a little so we don't we're already sure. at 10 minutes. So let's get going. So uh, on the right hand of this picture is robot room. The right hand robot is the V300. The left hand robot is the classic. And on the and this is the existing. Um, and then on the left hand, that's the waiting area is kind of in the background. Um, and this is to the B300. And then this is where our cow would go into the robot milk and then she would come out. And we put little saloon gates there to make sure that cows aren't, you know, kind of roadblocking too much. And that once they're out, they're out. Off they go. And then when she comes out, uh, the slide on the left or the picture on the left, that's where she's come out of that saloon gate. She's now turning to the right. She walks there, she hits some other gates and then she turns to the right and now she's here. And that's where the classic comes out on the right-hand side there. Again, some gates so we can't have a cow come in there and block those cows from coming out. They're motivated to move down to that gate on the far end because on the other side of that gate, I want my drink of water. This is drinking water. And you can see there's a fair number of cows here Imagine double the cows, which is what we're going to do this year. Hence, it's, I think, really good that we're going to have cows cut down alley, you know, the milk or that new alley, as opposed to everybody just dumping out into here, um, that some cows will be here or some cows will be there. Uh, and these cows are just kind of hang out here as long as they want, do their thing. And then, and then they go through that finger gate. And when they go through that finger gate, now they're starting getting into the feed and the beds. So they can go and feed, they can lay down, they can ruminate, they can do what they want to do, but they can't come back for water unless they walk the circuit. And feed bunk. Um, currently, we're, we were kind of challenged on feed this year. Uh, there was a problem in our fields last year. We weren't allowed to use the feed organically. Uh, something had happened at a supplier and uh, it got resolved. Thank God our, our ground is still certified, but we were not able to grow our baleage and, and utilize it from last year. Uh, so this is straight alfalfa um, and a little bit of triticale and a little bit of, uh, of grain from the mixer uh, that we mix up and, and feed. 
Um, currently, we've been feeding once a day uh, with the mixer. Uh, the feed pusher runs about 10 times a day. When we double the cows, we're going to switch to two a day feeding. Uh, just keep a small load in the mixer, better mix, uh, make everything a little easier, and hopefully encourage cows to kind of keep moving and doing their thing as opposed to in kind of you know slugs into the system that might happen. And then that's the other side of the feed alley coming out, and they're going to you know keep walking uh, towards just in that continual circuit uh, if they want to. The water that's back there we had used before, we don't use it anymore. Uh, we found that it slowed down the, the frequency of movement. Um, and given that the cows, no matter what, when they hit that one gate, can get a drink of water, it's up to them. It's their choice. Just They have a job just like we do. Um, this is pasture gate. Um, so they go, cow, picture on the left, cow walks in there. There's the reader, reads her little ISO tag on her ear, says, do you have milking permissions? Yes or no. If no, it cuts her back to the right. If yes, picture on the right, she gets to walk straight out to pasture. Then they go into a grazing lane. And grazing lane is really simple. Single strand of hot wire on either side. Um, every, every 60 feet, they come to a 20 foot opening where we basically just put the hot wire from one side, we clip it onto you know, the spring handle, clip it onto the other side. So she hits that, she turns into this paddock, which is 60 feet wide by about 525 feet long. Um, and for us, it's a really good way to manage the grass because in the spring, it's just going, it's growing like crazy, big, tall vegetative stuff. Whereas in the summer, it slows down a bit. Um, and so we can, by just putting up a single strand of hot wire, we can give them a 60 foot wide by 525. We can give them 60 foot with a quick cross fence, single strand of 200, or we can give them 120 foot. It's really variable and very easy to do. And what we focus on is not, you know, this is paddock one or paddock two, and we're rotating back in 20 days. It might be 20 days. It might be 50 days. It just depends how much grass is out there and how much do we want to give them right now to suit the needs of the grass and the grass farming that we need to do while making sure that obviously milk is happening and milking frequency is happening. That's an example of some cows uh, grazing. Um, I would say our stocking density is usually a little bit higher than that. This was from this picture is from several years back um, when we still had collars and things like that. But it, but it does give you an example of that very simple uh, paddock system that we use. This is just the whole key to, to making the grazing work is keeping your grass vegetative. If you let your, your grass go into transition phases, reproductive phases, uh, it's just you've slowed down your, your, um, your growth rates uh, and you've greatly decreased the quality uh, in terms of its ability to, to make the milk uh, that you're wanting to make. Um, I think, yeah, so this is really interesting though. So we took some forage samples uh, in 2021. You can see April 14th, 2021, protein is low, sugar's really high. But just a, you know, a month later, without us having done anything to this grass, except have one grazing in between, um, protein's shot way up, sugar's come way down. And you would never know. To look at the grass, it looks exactly the same. Um, so I can't stress enough that the, the management of forage, um, you, you have to be taking tests, you have to be out there thinking about what's going on with the grass. It's not just grazing. It's it can really make a dramatic impact on what's happening with the cows. Um, and for example, in the 414, uh, we had to be very, very careful not to tip the cows into acidosis. Uh, we've had that happen before, unbeknownst. It's like we had no idea there was so much sugar out there. And that's when we started taking more tests. Um, it's actually a study, a study that's written about. It's quite interesting. This was a great overview. Thank you, Jan. Very exciting. And then uh, good luck on the new projects. Looks very, very good, too. Uh, Jim can join us and uh, we'll uh, work some of the questions. We have one question here already. What is the difference in maintenance cost between the Classic and the V300? I don't know if you know that. I don't know. Um, I think they're somewhat similar. The problem is the classic's bloody hard to work on. It's all kind of <laughs> tight in the box. V300, it's open, it's in your face. You can get in there a lot easier and do stuff. It's a lot easier to figure out, um, at least mechanically. Both of them are complicated to me. You know, you've got an electronic system, you've got a mechanical system, you've got a hydraulic system, you've got an air system, and they're all working. There's a lot going on. Um, but I think, I think the B, V300 is more approachable. 
there's some different things go, that go on in software. You have a software tool that helps you on the V300 versus on the classic. Um, but for me, the V300 is probably easier, but cost-wise, I think other than your time, um, I think it's about the same, at least for us. And you have a provider right nearby, a service provider or no? We do, we okay, do. Good. Yeah, so actually it's a good point. So part of the reason we chose D-Laval, because this may come up, um, mm -hmm. At the time that we installed, D Laval had 18 robots in this region. There was a technician team. They'd been there a long time. There was dedicated staff. The folks who were selling lately, nice folks, they had a farm. It was three hours away and there was no dedicated staff. Like, eh, we better go this way. And so we went, we went with the D Laval. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Yep. yep. Well, people are quiet today. I usually by now have a ton of questions. Come on, people. <laughs> Jim, do you have? Go ahead, yeah, man. I've got a question for you. It sounds like you do somewhat seasonal calving. And so how does that work with a robotic system? Do you um, tell us about your calving interval and reproductive schedule and how that works with your system or your goals with a organic herd? Sadly, this is our reproductive schedule <laughs> because we can't sink um, and those kinds of things. So it's just pretty much if you see a cow and heat, she gets bred. Um, we do the best we can to stay on top of it. And then from time to time, because we have been a growing dairy where we were buying in springers at uh, different periods, um, there would be a slug that would come in and then you were kind of subject to when are they now needing to be bred. For the most part, we've trended a little bit more towards uh, the cows are kind of late fall, early late fall, coming into calf uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, coming fresh. Um, and the reason for that being that we get paid a lot more during the winter months. We're paid on components and we get a we get a bonus in winter months, in fact, on top of that. So we like to capture that, hey, they're fresh and they're producing more milk while they're also producing more components. Um, but it's not it's not intentional. And at this point, if we're maxing out the capacity, we're really going to be focused on trying to <coughs> keep a level, you know, a more level, level circumstance with that which is where the breeding pen and just making that practice work so well is just going to be so important to us going forward. Mm -hmm. Sorry, coming back to the maintenance, there's a, a little follow up here uh, on the sure. maintenance question. What do you attribute uh, the manage, the cost of maintenance to primarily and what have you defined um, to decrease this cost, for example, what's controllable? First year we spent a hundred grand maintaining one robot. Oh, and we wow. had 108 times in the first month and we had no clue how to fix anything. So that's okay. that's a really good example of what good doesn't look like. Um, and that wasn't their fault. That was my fault. I had to learn, right? It's just normally you're going to learn these things. But it's something to be aware of if somebody's coming new to robots. There's a learning curve. Sure. And if you're not used to mechanical things, it's how do you how do you learn how to learn it? You've got to go out there. You've got to practice. You've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to start tearing it apart before it's broken. And... Also recognizing that although there's technicians, there's also turnover with staff for technicians. Mm -hmm. They're not all up to speed 100% either. And you can't call the one guy who's been running the, you know, the dairy route for 30 years and say, how do you fix this? He knew how to fix a parlor. Robot's really different. Right. So it's a challenge. Um, but what I found is over time, you get more and more practice. If you're, every time the technicians come out, roll up your sleeves, get out there with them and help them, you'll learn. Mm -hmm. um, and then you still got... You still got the big, you know, and definitely do planned and routine maintenance on a daily basis. Start finding the systems that you want to check. So if it's going to be broken, it's today, not 3 a.m. tonight, because that's a real drag. Um, and that often happens. You know, it's, oh, I forgot to check this simple thing. And if I'd done this during the day, I'd still be sleeping right now. Um, so that was really important. And then the other thing is you'll have big tech items. You know, oh, my, my vacuum pump went down or this VFD went out. Those are more of the problems we had kind of this last year uh, were related to, to things like that. Mm -hmm. We've gotten quite a bit better about doing our own maintenance. We've talked to our, com our robot company, uh, De Laval, about it. And we said, look, you guys need to have training. Let's organize training. We'll pay for the training. Come out here. We'll invite five other farmers. You guys teach us how to do this stuff. And we've tried to have trainings right here and just do whatever we can to address this problem. Um, De Laval is now working as a company on putting training online. They're actually building a training program finally, which is great. Um, and I think, I think you know, as robots mature, as more, as more small farms and other large farms and just farms in general come onto robotic systems, there's more pressure for them because the shops, the, main, the, the, the technicians, they can't handle it all. It's too much work. Mm -hmm. um, and the dealers aren't going to be able to sell them if they, if they cost too much to maintain. People have to be able to do the work. Makes sense, yes. 
Yeah. Jim, I don't know if you want to kind of follow up with the, another question on maintenance here, then we can move to a different topic. There's a second question here. It's still about maintenance. Sure. The question is kind of uh, 2100 and 700 for kind of a low farm. Uh, have other costs, here's a question, so I'm not sure quite what it means. Have other cost assumptions or assumed benefits proved accurate? So I'm not yeah, quite not exactly. sure so the dealer says what. That it's going to cost you roughly this much to do it. Has that oh, proved? Okay. Yeah, they Maybe have. That's... And, and the, their assumptions, I think, have proved accurate. Again, we had mm -hmm. some unusual stuff this last year. Vacuum pump went out, BFD went out. So that drives that cost up. Um, but I think when they told us, I think they had told us there was a range of like 700 bucks to about maybe 2000 bucks mm -hmm. when we initially got into it per robot. And they did tell us that the guys who are doing their own maintenance are on this end and the guys who aren't, they have us do everything over here. We don't have them do everything, but it was, you know, like I say, it's been an improvement area for trying to move the needle back to average. Sounds good. I'm switching a little bit to feeding now. Um, what do you feed in the robot and how much? Is it uh, production dependent or how do you do that? Yeah, so um, this is interesting. So I'm not sure how the ladies work, but on the D-Laval system, sorry, on the D-Laval system, you can, the cow comes into the robot um, and she's she's got a ration. You've set up a ration table, a feed table, and, it, and you can also set your dispense rate and the max per visit, and you can tell it how many teats are still milking when you stop dispensing. So we've got that set. So when she's only got two teats left to milk, it stops dispensing. We've got our dispense rate uh, set at a certain rate, and we've got our max per visit set at a certain rate. So right now we're targeting, we only want five pounds of grain into those cows in the robots per day. We used to feed 12 and it worked, but it also took a long time. Cows in there, she's looking the bowl. You know, it's not good for getting a high throughput of cows milking. Um, so given that we're headed towards, we want to run more capacity, tighter capacity, we've changed that, brought that down, and we're feeding more at the bunk. And what we feed in there um, is, um, uh, is currently it's a rolled corn, 60% uh, rolled corn. Uh, and then there's a, you know, kind of a mineral pellet uh, kind of thing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it works well, the cows like it. Uh, but we did have a point uh, where we got a new new supply of feed from the from our, our grain mill, I guess you would call it. Um, and I guess something in the mineral or something which is really off and the cows just, they refused. And of course, you see when the cows are not getting that grain in the robot, they still have to go through in our system, which is good, but they weren't happy about it. They're kicking the robot, they're, they're off come the teacups. It, it's, it's not a good situation. Having that grain in there that they like definitely helps. Keeps them calm. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Okay, Jim, next question, please. Uh, is it more challenging to train cows and heifers or people to work in the robotic <laughs> system? <laughs> That's a good question. So what's your opinion? Training the cows it, it or be, training the people? Both. It can be both. Mm. Um, I think that if you create an environment where the cows have to do the work on their own and the people don't have to be involved, then it's pretty straightforward. The cow eventually will get the job. They'll have a few rough days while they're sorting out the gates or whatever else, but they'll get the job. If you, if you don't create that environment, they're going to have a rough time with people trying to figure out how to make that work. And they're going to have a rough time with cows because they're having a rough time with people. So I think it really, really comes down to figuring out how are you going to help those cows on their own want to go and milk and have that be a really reliable and sustainable part of your system. Okay, we'll do one final question before I stop recording here, Jan, and then we have uh, maybe a few other questions afterwards if you have time to stay with us. So great presentation. I would like to understand better, a bit better about the training of the close-up cows. Do you train all close-up cows or only the yes. heifers? And do you have a robot only for them or is this robot also used for the milking cows? So the robot is, currently the robot has been used also for milking cows, although we're going to have enough new springers that we buy in, because we'll only buy springers when we do a herd expansion, that we're talking about maybe dedicating one robot to springers, so they have a better competitive chance size-wise of going in there uh, for that first lactation, um, and having a high milking frequency, which as you know, is so important to getting a good milk production. And yes. uh, at the same time, all the cows that we put in the close-up alley, which are there for about two weeks, they all go through and get that opportunity to train. Because they're also getting a little bit of grain, which we want from a nutritional standpoint, because it's got mineral and all those other things that we want them to have around, around calving. It's, a, it's kind of a transitional program in general. 
Great. So I just want to officially uh, end the recording here and thank you for coming today, Ian, and talking to us about your operation. Very interesting. I want to thank all of you who attended and also invite you to attend the next webinar on April 20th. Um, and we'll see you then. Thank you very much.